Hello and welcome back to another conversation here on Jewish Sacred Aging, jewishsacredaging.com. We want to welcome you back with our guest, Rabbi Louis Aaron, the Director of Religious Services at Lionsgate Continuing Care Retirement Community here in Southern New Jersey and the Jewish Community Chaplain. And in our previous conversation, we were really talking about that whole continuum of care and your role as the, as the chaplain on the Director of uh, Religious Services at Lionsgate. And I want to continue uh, this conversation, Lewis, on some other issues. Um, one of the things we were talking about this before, uh, that seems to be a, a very um, important part of your work, and as you were explaining, uh, really is in, indigenous to a healthy environment, is education. You do a lot of education uh, in Lionsgate, correct? And, and yes. what's the benefit of it? What do you find as a result of that? Well, I think I probably do far more programming than most chaplains do. So not, not only the uh, liturgical religious programming, but also in terms of uh, education. And since I have a fairly highly educated population, I have to be able to, to address the, our clients at that same level. And that doesn't really depend so much on their cognitive uh, strength that people who are suffering from various forms of dementia just lose their ability to remember. They don't become any less intelligent. So I have to be able to speak on the same high level to uh, those people, as well as people who have uh, much more uh, cognitive strength. They don't suffer from dementia or forgetfulness in any way. So we were talking about uh, issues of uh, Darwinism and how Darwin... Uh, Darwin's theories evolved and the historical background for it and the necessary, um, the necessary things that had to go have in place before Darwin could do the work in terms of the history of, of European expansion, the collection of specimens, the organization of, uh, of life, uh, the discovery of stratigraphy, all these certain things to get into place. And this was for our uh, safe haven group, and these are people who are suffering from uh, Alzheimer's and related dementia, and they were excited and involved, and it was honoring who they were, made them feel good about themselves, though if they remember anything about the discussion, probably not, but as a rabbi, I spent enough time in the pulpit to realize that most people don't remember anything I said anyway, so it really is how I get them to feel. So it's a good way of doing it, but on another level, some of what I do as I think about it is in terms of uh, intellectual therapy, keeping the mind active, helping people think about issues in new ways, giving them information that they may not have had. I try to address all classes on what I would call a uh, college level without, mm -hmm. without tests. Sometimes I wish I could give them tests, and sometimes I wish I could give them homework, but that really isn't fair. And uh, because of the nature of the community, and I'm there all the time, unlike uh, pulpit rabbis who can usually run an adult education class for three, four sessions, I can run a 15, 20 session uh, class on uh, almost any topic that uh, suits my fancy. We do two classes right now in our independent living. One now is a discussion of Midrash based on a fairly classic American book called The Hammer on the Rock from the mid 20th century, and we're discussing that. We're also working on a uh, series of lectures through the Learning Company, but this is the one on the beginning of Judaism. It's uh, the video lecture is by a man named Isaiah Gaffney. And what I do is I uh, actually function as the uh, TA. I give a uh, half an hour introduction oh, right. to the uh, lecture. We listen to the lecture, and then I field questions. And that's about an hour and a half program. So we do something similar in our assisted living and also in our skilled nursing. So that's, I think, important, especially for people who may be looking at this and contemplating moving a loved one into a facility that, that, that even in the skilled nursing, there are opportunities for this education. What, what, what does a class in the skilled nursing unit look like? It looks basically the same. We have a broad concept at Lionsgate, which we call Lionsgate University. So we take in lectures from the outside, try to do all sorts of programs that will keep people cognitively excited. And depending really on whatever group it is within uh, the uh, skilled nursing, we'll have to change it. Some people there are physically in 
physically impaired and cognitively impaired, so they really cannot benefit so much from the so the more lecture discussion style. So we would provide music, art, and pick you know type of work. Generally, what I've been doing with my skilled nursing clients is to read and discuss books at this point. That's usually easier. What I find is that uh, many of my colleagues have found that when you're even dealing with, again, a, a people who are suffering from Alzheimer's and related dementia, they, we only have their attention for a short while. So uh, aphorisms and proverbs and short pieces really work. Poetry works very well. So that keeps people attentive for 5, 10, 15 minutes, and then one can move on to the next topic. And it's interesting for me, and it's also interesting for them. So it's, very, it's fascinating in the sense that, that in, your, in your role, you're really creating almost individualized modules of education to meet the various stages that you meet at, at, at the CCRC. Yes. Um, there may be people looking here who... who are facing a decision about placement of, of a loved one. As the director of, of religious services at a continuing care retirement community, how do you interface with these families who may be taking a tour? Do they, do they come and talk to you? They want to know about the, the, the religious services, the education? They, how, how involved are you uh, in this intake process? I think for most of the people who look at Lionsgate, I'm seen as value added. Okay. I don't think that they see it as essential. I don't think that most of our Jewish people see the spiritual, religious aspect of Jewish culture as essential to their lives. So the families themselves, it, the, during that process or the interviewing process, that program will be mentioned, but what, you're, what I'm hearing you say is not a lot of families seek you out. No. Okay. I think it usually is, oh, that's really nice. Okay. I'm glad you have it, but I think they are more concerned with, will mom, dad, aunt, uncle, grandma, be grandpa safe. be safe? Okay. Will they be safe? Will, be their, will their physical needs be taken care of? And when, when these residents, and you're dealing with the residents of, of CCRC, of Lionsgate, have you found over the course of your tenure there that as people age and as people become part of the community, their, for want of a better term, religious or spiritual needs, um, there are more of them. They sort of like discover something about this uh, and they seek you out for either counseling or they come to services or they attend the classes. Well, I usually try to make myself available all the time. Again, it's uh, the closest job I had to this before was when I was in rabbinical school and I was the camp rabbi. <laughs> the, uh, the most effective part of what I do is just being present, walking around, talking to people, uh, giving them the opportunity to come to me to talk about whatever is on their mind. And it could be something, I really don't know what, Everything has a spiritual aspect. Right, right. So uh, whatever topic they're talking about is important for them at that moment. So that's what I'm willing to talk about. Okay. So I don't know, know what really is the underlying uh, story, and I sometimes don't really need to go there. So if they want to complain about the Phillies, that's okay with me. Well, it's easy to do that. That's easy to do that. Or the food, let's say. You know. The food, no, I try to explain that. I try to do a lot of explaining right. in the world, trying how it works, but really trying to honor where they are and what they want to talk about. And just try to be, for the most part, a friendly listener. Do they, uh, I'm sure that you get a lot of personal stories. I mean, are people telling you their stories? Or shouldn't I assume that? People will tell me stories, and sometimes... Uh, Sometimes they're very personal. Quite often they are quite painful. Right. Uh, very few people go through this life without being bumped. And we have a number of people who went through very difficult circumstances. We have a good number of Holocaust survivors. One of the uh, moving uh, issues is that you, I'm in, a, in our services, many of our Holocaust survivors are there. So running services for Holocaust survivors is always a challenge, challenge. and an honor. And it's gotten me to really look at different parts of uh, Scripture, particularly Torah, in uh, unusual ways. That 
Just for example, now I'm reading Deuteronomy, Devarim, as survivor literature. Really? That it's, a, at least in the historical setting, it's addressed to the children who survived the tragedy of Egypt, the slavery, and to their children. So it's talking to the older, the remains of the first generation the remnant, survivor, the remnant, right. and also to the second generation of survivors being talked to as the memory of one of the survivors. It's survivor literature. And there may also be that in its historical setting, depending on how one wants to date That's the book, That's interesting. book of Deuteronomy. Right. And if you put it as a post-exilic uh, composition, then that it gives it even greater power. So in the couple of minutes we have left, I, I, I just want to raise this issue because it's very topical. It's, uh, and I'm sure you deal with us on a, on a fairly regular basis. And that is those last moments of life, that, that advanced care moment, those, those times when, when you are called upon to work with an individual and a family as life begins to ebb. In that setting, in that CCRC setting, um, what are the most powerful moments, what are the most powerful messages that you receive from these individuals uh, as you, um, in many cases, I would imagine, accompany them? Or at least to that, to the end. That's really a difficult question to answer in terms of what I'm receiving from them. I think what I try to do with that circumstance is try to remind people and the family and the individual that death is part of life, that there is nothing inherently bad with death, that it is something that is normal and expected, and it's a journey that we will all make, and that uh, we can learn some wonderful things by being present at the death of a loved one, or if we are the person dying, by the way we die, and how we can continue teaching those we uh, care about, about every part of life, and since death is a part of that, teaching our children and our grandchildren how to leave this world just as we taught them how to live in this world. So, in, as we said before, in that this, this theme of these two conversations, in many ways, it is about dignifying and sanctifying the concept of letting go. Yeah. And from the moment that one enters until the moment one leaves this community. So thank you for your service. Well, there's a wonderful rabbinic story about we enter this world with our hands cl right. closed, that we want to grasp everything. And if we leave it, we... Uh, empty. Empty. Or, or open. Or open. Or open. Or, or open. Tarichim, shrouds, open. don't come with pockets. No, no. Thank you very much. Rabbi Louis Aaron, the director of rabbinic services and religious services as well at Lionsgate Continuing Care Retirement Community here in southern New Jersey and the community chaplain. Thank you very much for being part of our conversations here on Jewish Sacred Aging. To all of you, thank you for watching. See you next time. Take care.